Welcome to another CME podcast episode from NEI, the Neuroscience Education Institute. In today's CME episode, Dr. Andrew Cutler will be interviewing Dr. Rajnish Mago about best practices for early detection and screening of tardive dyskinesia. For complete CME information, please refer to this podcast description page or go to nei.global forward slash podcast. Let's listen in as Drs. Cutler and Mago discuss the current research and guidelines on early detection and screening for tardive dyskinesia. Welcome to another episode of NEI Podcasts. And today's title, I think, is really fun. It's Catch Me If You Can, Early Screening and Detection for Tardive Dyskinesia. And with me today is a good friend, uh, someone who is a real expert in the field of psychopharmacology, somebody whose work I admire. That's Dr. Raj Mago. Raj, not too bad. Thank you for having me, Andy. Well, you're very welcome. So today we're going to be talking about not just tardive dyskinesia, not only the usual things. And uh, by the way, Raj, you know, we did our Saturday morning live and you gave a yes. talk on tardive dyskinesia that was really terrific, very clinically relevant. Thank so, you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to really focus on screening for TD, recognizing TD, and also the importance of earlier diagnosis, especially in those at higher risk. And we'll talk about who's at high risk. So let's just start out broadly. Uh, maybe, Raj, would you mind terribly just defining what is tardive dyskinesia? So, you know, the word tardive dyskinesia or antipsychotic should really be antipsychotic induced tardive dyskinesia because tardive dyskinesia like movements have been known to occur even in people who have never taken an antipsychotic. So, you know, before antipsychotics were even introduced in 1952, we know that people would have uh, these kinds of dyskinetic movements. Mm -hmm. If we use the full term antipsychotic induced tardive dyskinesia, each part of this term like tells us something. Antipsychotic induced is obvious that it occurs, you know, a few weeks or months after starting an antipsychotic. Mm -hmm. The word tardive comes from tardy, which means so it occurs late in in the course of treatment with antipsychotics. So sometimes we can have when we start an antipsychotic, we can get dyskinetic movements that start almost immediately or within the first few days. That's not tardive dyskinesia. Mm -hmm. Tardive dyskinesia occurs. People argue terribly, you know, a lot about like what is an exact minimum duration and there is no exact minimum duration, but it is very unlikely to occur, you know, earlier than one to three months, although that is theoretically at least possible. But it also evolves slowly. This is another aspect of the tar tar dive is it won't start overnight. Mm -hmm. So firstly, it will start after a few weeks or months. And secondly, it it will evolve slowly. And then we have dyskinesia. The word dyskinesia implies dys, meaning abnormal, or and kinesis, of course, has to do with movement. So it's an abnormal, abnormal movements, but not just any kind of abnormal movements. It is the movements of tardive dyskinesia are described as being choreoathetoid. Mm -hmm. What that means is it's a combination of choreform movements. Chorea is a little bit like, you know, the word choreography means you know when they plan dances that's called choreography in movies and whatnot mm -hmm. so that tells us that these are dance like dance like movements and athetoid are slow and twisting movements mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a combination of that they are very peculiar these movements as then as i was trying to say not rhythmic they occur at an irregular interval and they are typically slow so they occur maybe Commonly, they, they, they can be of many different kinds, which is which, which the term used is polymorphic. Mm -hmm. So it's not the same movement occurring over and over again. That's polymorphic. They typically occur slowly as in contrast to, let's say, ticks or tremors, which occur rapidly. And they occur at irregular intervals. The difference between one movement and the next one keeps varying. Mm -hmm. So I guess I gave... Um, I tend to give a long answer to a straightforward question, and this is another example of that. Uh, oh, that was a wonderful answer. And I heard you say this once before, too. I share something with you in that I was often called tardy in school as well <laughs> because I was late. So I found yes, that a great yes. way to remember this tardive. 
you know, it's also a true, and it, it's fascinating to me, that different patients manifest tardive dyskinesia differently. It, it, it's very variable. You know, classically, we were taught it's uh, oro buccal lingual in the face, but you can really yeah. see it in pretty much any mu muscle in the body, right? Right. That's true. I mean, it's still true that most of the, you know, maybe I don't know exact number, but, you know, over two thirds of the movements, or maybe 75% of the movements, they tend to occur still in the facial area, the muscles of facial expression, the lips, the tongue and the jaw. Mm -hmm. So certainly we have to focus on that, but you're making a good point, Andy, that, and this is very relevant in telemedicine, that if we think that TD is only in the face, then we will be content with just looking at the patient on the screen, you know, just seeing the patient's face. Yes. And based on what you pointed out, the significance of that is that we have to figure out some way of being able to look at the the entire body because they can be in the hands uh, and in the feet, in the toes. It can even be in the trunk, the diaphragm, yes. the pharynx, anywhere. And yes. The other thing, besides the fact that every patient manifests it slightly differently in a different part of the body is we give a lot of people in a psychotics, but they don't all develop tardive dyskinesia. Yes. There must be genetics to this. Right. Yeah. Certainly the people are vulnerable and those who are vulnerable will tend to develop it in the first few years. So, mm -hmm. as, you know, the, in, in the, as the years go by, the people, most of the people who are going to develop the tardive dyskinesia are likely to develop it in, th in the first few years of the treatment. So, but we don't always know. We know some risk fact, general risk factors, like yeah. broadly, mm -hmm. but not uh, probably, th there's no way to identify the risk in one particular person, yes. like more, yes. uh, preci more precisely. It'd be great if we had a genetic test, of course, for this vulnerability, but we don't. Yes. Why don't we just, for the audience, let's review some of those risk factors that you alluded to. Sure. The, the most important risk factor, and I really want the listeners to please remember this because this is the biggest risk factor is age. Mm -hmm. So people who are older, they say older than 55, which is not really old, but mm -hmm. middle-aged and old, I guess. Older people are at 10 times greater risk. So Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a completely different ball game when you are using antipsychotics in older patients versus younger patients. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, women are at higher risk than than men. Mm -hmm. Patients with mood disorders and intellectual disability, so in terms of the conditions, they are at greater risk. Mm -hmm. And the fact that people with mood disorders are at greater risk is of great importance because, as you know, now we are treating so many more patients with antipsychotic medications because we are using, not just for schizophrenia, but we are using antipsychotics for to augment antidepressants in major depressive disorder. We are also using them frequently for various stages of bipolar disorder, mania, hypomania, depression, and maintenance treatment, all of them. Mm -hmm. so, so the mood disorders being a risk factor is very significant. Other risk factors, you know, which we encounter less frequently are people who have, you know, who had a head injury or have other neurological conditions. Uh, they have Down syndrome, intellectual disability. So if there's like damage to the brain in any way, pre-existing, you can think more, think broadly, that person might be at higher risk. But I'll repeat one more time, the, being an older person is the biggest risk factor. Now, in terms of the antipsychotics, also they are risk factors. So if the person is on a first generation antipsychotic, I know this is controversial and some people have tried to downplay this and we could go over it in more detail. But I, it, it, to cut to the chase, it is, I'm absolutely convinced that first generation antipsychotics have a much higher risk mm -hmm. of causing tardive dyskinesia. Yes. That doesn't mean we should never use them, but uh, we should be aware of this. Mm -hmm. And lastly, a risk factor that that we frequently don't uh, take into account is that when we are doing an initial evaluation on a patient, or let's say we are going to now start antipsychotic, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things, so what are we going to look for? We're going to take into consideration the age and these other factors, but we should also look at how much antipsychotic has this person already taken in their life? Mm. Because one of the biggest risk factors, the other than age, is cumulative exposure. Yes. It adds up. Yeah. They are carrying with them the marks of all the antipsychotic they have taken. So we should try to quantify, okay, they 
you, supposing that person took one antipsychotic for a year and then another one for six months and another one for six months. So then you say, okay, this person has a two year, two years of cumulative exposure. And you keep that in mind uh, in assessing how much risk is one, this particular person, what, you know, is this a person with at high risk of tardive dyskinesia, medium or low risk? Right. And also uh, we sometimes talk about the potency of the antipsychotic at the D2 receptor. So yes. first generations yes. are very potent. Uh, they have high affinity for dopamine receptors. Right, um, right. I, miss, I missed that and that's true, oh, yes. Okay. And the potency of D2 receptors, uh, we, you know, we don't know it for a fact in second generation antipsychotics. Mm -hmm. it, it, this is such an important question, but there is no, yes. we don't have an answer to that. Yes. Whether one of them has a lower risk or a higher risk. And mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. think that the potency blocking D2 receptors is related to the risk of tardive dyskinesia, mm -hmm. but we don't know if know if it's if that means that certain anti among the second generation antipsychotics, if some of them have a higher or lower risk is not really clearly known. Yeah. I think that there is some consensus that clozapine probably has a, the lowest risk. Yeah, it is. You know, there, so there is no actual study that showed this in comparison, like close up. I've looked into this because I was asked this question mm -hmm. a few months ago. Mm -hmm. So I like actually spent time, you know, when other people are out playing golf, Andy, <laughs> I'm having fun. I'm sitting in my pajamas like this is what I do, right? I have no life. Oh, yes. So I, I well, th that's, we're all very grateful for that, Raj. We're all the beneficiaries of that. <laughs> So, yeah, I spent a lot of time looking into this uh, question of the, is, uh, any antipsychotic that has lower risk of, mm -hmm. and so there is no he no head-to-head -head study actually that shows that clozapine right. has a lower risk, like meaning that there's no actual comparison. Right. And there are many cases of clozapine-induced tardive dyskinesia that have been published. Mm -hmm. I think partly uh, it is true though that when you add, clo you know, in the, in in the old days, when they, we didn't have the BMAT2 inhibitors, one of right. the things that was considered was to switch to clozapine. Yes. And the tardive dyskinesia seemed to improve. And that's probably the main origin of this uh, belief. Okay. But so. uh, as uh, Dr. Jonathan Meyer pointed out in our uh, uh, talks, in his talk this past weekend, are you really going to switch somebody to clozapine just because they have tardive dyskinesia? Probably not. I mean, unless they were a suitable candidate for clozapine, Mm -hmm. for other reasons like treatment mm -hmm. resistance. Yeah, that makes sense. And then there's also, you know, the lure, if you will, that uh, patients who develop the acute drug-induced movement disorders yes. may be at risk for tardive. They're telling you something about their dopamine system. Would you agree with that? Yes, that is an, another one that I didn't fail to mention. So all, so Parkinson, so drug-induced Parkinsonism, mm -hmm. acute dystonia, and mm -hmm. all the three movement disorders that occur, antipsychotic induced movement disorders that occur early on, are believed to predict the risk of tardive dyskinesia. No, this is not an absolute, but it is one of the things that you can take into consideration. All right. Well, that's really helpful. Now, we've talked about especially these vulnerable populations. Can you talk, and you alluded to this, that tardive dyskinesia may evolve. So what is the importance of earlier diagnosis of TD? Yeah. You know, one of the things, one of the things that we, uh, we should all realize is that for years I used to, you know, when I was younger, I used to, I, I did so much uh, crazy stuff wrong, so, so many things that are were incorrect. And one of them was I used to tell patients that, you know, we'll monitor you and if you develop develop tardive dyskinesia, we'll stop the antipsychotic and, you know, it'll, uh, the, uh, that will reverse the tardive dyskinesia if we detect. But, uh, but in fact, tardive dyskinesia is all, is, is usually irreversible and we should realize that. And so we want to detect it early for two reasons. One is that, you know, we still hope that, and I have seen patients, I, I have personally seen patients where they had a minimal or very, you know, just very early tardive dyskinesia. And we were, the person did not necessarily need an antipsychotic. They were a big, the person with bipolar disorder who could be managed in other ways. And the tardive dyskinesia movements subsided. So, but, so, some, so that's one reason we hope that maybe if mm -hmm. there is an alternative plan, the, the TD could subside. Mm -hmm. But also then, uh, if not, if it doesn't subside, at least it is not going to progress. If you continue to blissfully, mm -hmm. if we are blissfully unaware and mm -hmm. keep treating the person with the antipsychotics and the TD and the TD keeps progressing until it becomes like it's literally staring us in the face. Yeah. That would not be a good situation. 
Well, that's really important for people to realize that this can evolve and progress. So I think you're right. What are some best practices for routinely and effectively screening for TD in our patients? Yeah, you know, we the reason we need to have a plan, and which is what we are going to discuss today, that we, we need to have a plan because amazingly to me, patients are typically unaware of these you know, so the person could be having involuntary movements of, let's say, perioral or otherwise. And and I, when I talk to the patient about it, the patient seems to have no awareness of this. So, uh, so, the, so we cannot rely on the patient to come to us and say that they are having involuntary movements. The other thing is that these movements, they look a little bit like ordinary movements. You know, like we have expressions on our face, we make grimace or we may do other things. Mm -hmm. And because these movements are slow, like a tremor or a tick is pretty clear cut, but the movements of TD, which are irregular, slow, twisting, they, they can look like normal facial expressions or other movements, you know, like we move our lips, we may purse our lips and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's why, that's another reason why we have to have some kind of plan. Mm -hmm. And the, the challenge is, you know, the challenge is firstly for people who don't have, you know, who are relative, who've not had a lot of experience, you know, like me having uh, both gray hair and lost my hair in doing this over 30 years, but others, it, they may focus so much, uh, younger clinician may focus so much on what the patient is saying. <laughs> that they don't simultaneously, they, are, some, they, are, they might miss things that they are seeing mm -hmm. about, you know, involuntary movements and other things. So that, it's so that, that, that makes it a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. And our visits have become shorter, yes. right? Like I see patients for 25 minutes and, and there's so much to do in those 25 minutes. Yeah. But a lot of people are seeing follow-ups in 15 minutes. Yes. So, so there, and, and there are so many things to be done. So in, in that with that pressure has making things difficult and as if we didn't have enough problems now we have now we are seeing a lot of us including me uh, are doing telemedicine right which has made the evaluation process even more difficult so because of all these things we need to have a best practices like a strategy we need to have some kind of strategy mm -hmm. that we are going to follow otherwise uh, we could easily be miss many cases of tardive dyskinesia yeah i agree and you know the uh, the newer apa guidelines that were updated for schizophrenia. Now there's a change here in, in how often we're supposed to look for TD, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, previously, so there's not a uniform agreement and we should not be too rigid in, in, in thinking about how frequently we need to examine the patient. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the thought is that the, the formal examination, like using, for example, the abnormal involuntary movement scale mm -hmm. in a high risk patient we, we should do it at least every six months mm -hmm. and in a low risk patient you know a younger patient on a second generation antipsychotic and we may do it once a year at least so this is a rough starting point this mm -hmm. to think about this so i'll repeat that higher risk patient every six months lower risk patient every one year at least but if we see some minimal movements or there is some other reason to be concerned then obviously we'll examine the patient more frequently. Sure. And then the other thing is, and this is very important and in reducing our the anxiety of clinicians. You know, we are so busy, we just feel, find it irritating that we have to do the AIMS examination and so on. Yes. But a lot of the TD can be detected through informal or semi-structured evaluation. Mm -hmm. So in every visit, as we are looking at the patient, we are ex just by looking at the patient, we are examining the patient for abnormal involuntary movements, right? And a lot of TD can be picked up as we get more, you know, we get more experience and we sensitize ourselves to observing patients. There are so many things that we can know about the patient if we just pay attention, you know, to abnormal involuntary movements, but also to how their eye contact changes as we are talking. When do they look away? you know, and so on. I don't want to go in, go off on, on that track, but like yeah. it's invol involuntary movements are only one of the things that we, we can um, identify if we are more vigilant in looking at the patient. So yes. informal evaluation at every visit and perhaps semi-structured evaluation intermittently 
more often than a full examination. Right. So what do I mean by a semi-structured evaluation? I mean that if this is not a visit where we are going to do a full AIMS examination, we may do some part of that examination. We may ask, for example, we may ask the person to, we may say, can you please open your mouth and keep your tongue in though? I typically do it with the patient because the patient feels a little awkward. So the patient opens the mouth and the tongue is in. I say, hold it for a few seconds. Okay, thank you. You can close your mouth. Or, and, or you may ask the patient to protrude the tongue. Or you may ask the patient to extend the hands, you know, with the, with the palms downward. So you can, so we can do a small part of the evaluation more frequently than doing like a full evaluation. Yeah. In fact, the new APA guidelines and some other guidelines now say that we should be screening for TD at every single visit on anyone on an uh, antipsychotic. And to me, that just means looking for it and asking about it not doing, like you said, a full AIMS exam. But it, it, at the very least, you know, we're assessing other things, their sleep, their appetite, whatnot. We should just say, have you noticed any abnormal movements? Has anybody commented? And as you've very well said, of just observing the patient. And you know, you what, you know, Andy, you made a good point that uh, uh, not just asking the patient, but asking, has anybody commented? Yeah. Because like I said, that you know, the patient is frequently unaware. Mm-hmm. And so it'll, it might be other people now, even if the person says no, they ha- nobody has commented. That sensitizes the sensitizes the patient to encourage their family members yes. to observe. So the family yes. members uh, can be a part of like the observation teams, mm-hmm. so to speak. Mm-hmm. Women sometimes are more aware, and because they do makeup on a daily basis, mm-hmm. and yeah. so they may they comparatively are more likely to pick up TD than than males. Yeah, and it's interesting you say sometimes people aren't aware. There's not really a sensory component to this. It's mostly movement unless there's some secondary complication like a sore in the mouth, you know, or teeth hurting from grinding or something like that. Yes. I mean, of course, once the movements are very severe, uh, which I have seen many patients in the old days of first-generation antipsychotics, unfortunately, I saw patients with very severe TD. Yes. And, you know, in that case, you can have more substantial impairment, like, for example, in holding a glass of water, if the fingers are moving or in buttoning the shirt and all that. But let's just hope and pray that none of our patients gets to that point, that we will yeah, detect course. them long before they get to that, get to that stage. Great. Okay. So how can we increase awareness for clinicians, especially about how important it is to detect this early? You know, one of the things is clinicians might wrongly assume or at least subconsciously assume that if the person has TD, I will pick it up. So that that I'm an experienced clinician, but Mm -hmm. studies have shown that when the formal examination was done, many more cases of TD were picked up by systematically focusing on each part of the body, you know, one by one and by doing the activation measures also. The activation measures will frequently reveal. So there are three of them in the AIM scale. And when you do those activation measures, like tapping the fingers, et cetera, that will bring out a more, you know, will be make it a little bit more likely to uh, detect movements. The other, other thing is that we need to have clinicians uh, formally trained because there were, there have been some studies where they found that the relatively simple training with using videos and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, really improve the ability of clinicians to identify uh, abnormal uh, involuntary movements. Yes. No, I think you're absolutely right. I, I don't know. A lot of us have not been well trained in this, and a lot of us have not been really well trained on how to perform an AIMS exam. Uh, yes, you know, so true. You know, people know what the scale looks like, and they sort of race through it. But really, it's important to take your time. And, and as far as the time issue, Raj, something I encourage people to do is maybe once or twice a year, schedule a double visit. You know, so you have the time to formally do an AIMS and really examine carefully for this. That, that, yeah, absolutely. That's a great idea because if we are trying to just fit the AIMS examination into a busy visit when we are doing 20 yeah. other things, then we'll get frustrated. If it is at all possible, you know, I'm, with tele- I'm only telemedicine now. I'm not seeing patients in the office at all since COVID started. Uh-huh. But those who have the option of who are doing a hybrid model maybe once a year bring the patient into the office. This, yes, yes. That would be the best yes. if you can bring the patient in once a year 
to lay eyes on the patient, you know, that would be the be, be a really good idea to do that. Yeah, I agree. Speaking of which, Rush, let's give our audience some pointers on doing the aims virtually on video. First of all, is this valid? Is it effective? Can you do it? Yeah, you know, the uh, neurology people, the movement disorders is a subspecialty of neurology. And the movement disorder clinics have published papers where they did telemedicine evaluation of their patients and showed and then had the same patient examined in person and showed that the, the telemedicine was an adequate way of assessing abnormal involuntary movements. But it does make it more difficult. It takes twice as long. I, yeah. You know, if you were seeing patient live and, and you're, you have some experience with this, maybe you can do it in five minutes or so. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that in a telemedicine, you can do it in less than 10 minutes, even if you are very experienced. Yeah, that's true. Do you have any tips for how to effectively do this on video? Yeah. So, you know, as I said before, like the informal evaluation, I keep harping on that point that, you know, we should be, we sh it should be on our minds to observe the patient. But in terms of like doing a full evaluation, the really, a really good thing to do is to have a family member or someone else have a, use a smartphone or a, or an iPad or something like a tablet and assist you. Mm -hmm. So we have, we tell the patient in advance, you, you know, I have text that I copy paste and send to the patient that the following will be needed. We need a room where there's a little bit of space where they can take a few steps, walk back and forth, right? Without yes. any furniture there. We'll need, can you have someone who can hold the phone mm -hmm. and, you know, show us you know how like on the phone you can you can switch the camera so that I would be seeing like what the person is, what the family member is seeing. Yes. I don't know if I'm being clear. So so the family member will point it out. And then we ide ideally we would like to have a chair in the room, available in the room, mm -hmm. a chair that is firm and doesn't have uh, arms. This That's the sort of like what we would ideally want. Mm -hmm. So we don't want the patient to sit on a soft sofa where they are sinking in, mm -hmm. which kind of like holds their body. And then they put their arms on the sides, uh, on the arms of the sofa. And that sort of hides the movements. So if such a chair is available, so, okay, to repeat, we need a little bit of space. Mm -hmm. We need a family member with a smartphone and we need a, a chair that is a, a firm chair without arms if possible. Yeah. I would say, too, to pay attention to the lighting. You know, it's sort of, we, we've learned this a little bit now doing so much Zoom, if you will. But yeah. you, you want to be front lit, not back lit, of course. Don't, you don't want them sitting in front of a window, which yeah. really messes up the light. So true. So true. I, from time to time, like I, this happens to me, like their person has bright light behind them. And I, I actually take a couple of minutes to have them uh, move yeah, uh, yeah. their, move their, their, uh, computer or laptop or, or phone, depending on what they are using. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really wise. And then, of course, having the ability to move the camera around, you know, you've got to see the legs. You've, you wanted them to lean in close with their mouth open to see the yes. mouth, you know, go through all of those. The things. phone makes it so much easier. I mean, I think that is the key point. Like out of all of these, please just don't try to do it I did try initially when COVID started, I tried to have them, you know, like use the same camera and then can you move back? And so that I can see more of you. It doesn't work well because most people don't live in huge houses where they can like, you know, yeah, go back 12, 15 feet uh, yes. uh, or something like that. Yes. So it's much better if somebody else is, there's a movable camera, meaning a smartphone. The smartphone is a blessing in so many ways. That is true. All right. We did talk a little bit about the timeline for screening and how to do that. And, and I think you laid it out beautifully that the bare minimum that the APA recommends is once a year for most patients and then those who are vulnerable or at risk once every six months. I have to be honest, I do it more frequently than that, Raj, on everybody. I, I try to do it at least twice a year on everybody. That's just me, but you know, you can do what you think. And of course, as you mentioned, if somebody is very vulnerable or if you've seen movements, you might want to yeah, do it yeah. again. You know, yeah. with regard to what you said, Andy, like I have also practiced something similar to that. And for the following reason, if I think that I'm going to examine this patient every year, you can be sure that some of them will, it'll end up being one and a half years for some reason or the other. Yeah, right. Well just think, yeah. Things, yeah, Murphy's law. It yeah. doesn't. So if you think every six months, yes. firstly, it's easier to remember. Yes. You know, that everybody's six months and then it won't 
frequently for a variety of reasons, it'll end up being eight months or nine months. So, so I, yeah, I think your suggestion is good that we should maybe aim to do it a little bit more frequently. No pun intended. We should aim to do it more frequently, yes. but, but be aware of that broad guideline. Yes. And I also think documentation is so important, isn't it? Not only documenting these things we're talking about, but documenting informed consent that you really discuss this with patients. Yes. No, people, you know, groan when we say documentation because they are busy yeah. and they are, they feel like, how can I be documenting every single thing, right? Yes, of course. So, uh, so the thing is, my tip about that is that if you say risks discussed, Mm-hmm. You, there is, it's not absolutely necessary that every single risk has to be spelled out mm-hmm. for any medicine. But for each medicine, if there is one side effect that is particularly dangerous or either dangerous as, for example, in lamotrigine. So if you say in lamotrigine, if you just say risk discussed, consent obtained, that's not sufficient because you would want to say risk discuss including a life of a serious rash that might be life threatening yeah that's a great or similarly for antipsychotics you should say including risk of involuntary movements which may be irreversible yeah i personally believe and this is not no lawyer has told me this but i personally believe that if you don't write uh, in, uh, which may be irreversible it's not truly informed consent because Mm-hmm. The patient may assume that the that the TD, you know, if I have the side effect, we'll stop the medicine and the TD will go away. Yeah. In yeah. fact, TD is one of the major reasons for psychiatrists being successfully sued. Mm-hmm. You know, like it, we would we think that suicidal suicidality is the main yes. reason, and of course, yes. it is one of one of them. But TD is really high up there mm-hmm. in terms of the reasons for being successfully sued. Mm-hmm. The but. It's not the fact that TD occurs. The fact right. that TD can occur is not our fault or not something that we can control. Right. The accusation is, where does it say in your note that you discussed with the patient, That's right. you told the patient that there can be involuntary movements at that and, and that these could be irreversible. Yeah. So, yes. So, it's like you said, you know, documenting the consent, just one sentence, documenting the consent is very important. Yeah, I totally agree with you. You know, we've talked about documentation, and so we should talk about documenting our screening tools. And so there are a couple of evidence-based screening tools to help detect TD, aren't there? Yes, yes. So, the, you know, the abnormal involuntary movement scale is, of course, the best known one, right? It was first published in 1976 for research reasons and then quickly became popular and then subsequently people published adding to it recommended methods of a formal examination. Mm -hmm. Uh, In my view, the value of the AIM scale is that number one is it it, it now comes with a detailed recommendations about how to examine the patient. Yes. Secondly, it, it, because you are, as you are filling out the scale, you're going to for, you know, in a systematic way, look at each part, right? Like it has these seven parts. Four of them are in the head, muscles of facial expression, lips and perioral area, tongue and jaw. And three of them are outside the head and neck, which are the, the upper limb and the lower limb. So so you'll, so you'll that's the second benefit. Examination method was number one. Secondly, you're going to focus on several parts of the body, like one by one. And it reminds you to not miss them. Uh, number three, it uh, you know you record the severity. Although the AIMS doesn't offer a very specific guideline about what exactly is mild, moderate, and severe, t- minimal, mild, moderate, and severe TD, one, two, three, four ratings. But nevertheless, at least you are documenting the severity. The fact that you sh- have the AIMS on the chart show is documentation that you are monitoring the patient. Yes, and then. The AIMS helps you to monitor change also, right? Like, so if I do the AIMS and I have like one or two minimal, I don't know about you, Andy, but like I frequently am not sure whether it really is TD. Like I'll see these little bit of movements and I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. And certainly then I'll repeat it earlier, like maybe in three months or so. And so you can, we can see the evolution also. So it's monitoring changes is also a good idea. Yeah. Can I just insert here one thing which I didn't mention earlier? I rarely see anybody doing an AIMS or or doing a like much of an evaluation for TD at before starting the antipsychotic. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, it's very important we, to get that baseline. Yeah, we want to get baseline. You know, I, I was giving the analogy in my talk the other day. I think I said this one uh, that it's like when you get a rental car, you walk around the car, right? Yes, With a map, exactly. Looking to see if there are da- any dents or scratches right. or something because right. they are pre-existing. Yes. You know, as a married man, I'm obsessed with uh, uh, showing that it wasn't my fault. <laughs> I understand. So, oh, yeah, so so the evaluation is not only after the antipsychotic is started, but even before, because these patients, you know, we, we are not seeing de novo patients. Most of us are seeing patients who have had extensive treatment in the past. Mm-hmm. And so they may have, for various reasons, they may have some involuntary movements even before we prescribe the antipsychotic. Yes, and as you well said, they have been, they were described in the pre antipsychotic era. So patients, especially with psychotic disorders, can have dyskinetic movements independent of medicine. Yes. It's and important to pick that up. Absolutely. The other reason I think, Rush, why it's helpful to do the AIMS is as I go around the country giving talks, I'm hearing that there are some insurance companies that before to justify payment for the VMAT2 inhibitors, valbenazine and, and uh, dutetrabenazine, they require an AIMS. And some of them require the item eight, which is the global severity score, to be a three, at least a three or higher, which is moderate. Right. And I think that's really a shame. That's not really how the drugs are indicated, approved to be used. Right. And, you know, the APA guidelines recommend treatment for moderate to severe, but they also say for milder forms, if it's causing impact or distress, that you should treat it. Right. Right. But, but so, so yeah, I agree with you that they should not be like a, you know, arbitrary rating that they are insisting on. But the idea of insisting on AIMS may not be a bad one, Andy, because if, if you're going to prescribe uh, this uh, powerful medications, powerful expensive medications, yes, you should be doing a thorough evaluation. So if you are doing an AIMS, you know, it's not too much to ask. No, I agree with you. I think there's many reasons to do the AIMS, but my concern is an insurance company requiring a certain score out of context, out of the clinical context, without That's, taking everything into account. Yes, yes. That I, art I do agree with, yeah. There is another scale, of course, called the discus. Can you talk a little bit about that one? Yeah, I don't use it, and I don't know if anybody use, uses it. So the discus, you know, was, was maybe, I don't know, let me think for a second, maybe, um, at least 15 years or 20 years after the AIMS right. was developed. Yeah, it's newer. And the idea was, idea is, it's very similar to the AIMS. If you put them side by side, yeah. you know, it's like yes. pretty much the same seven parts of the body. There's a small difference, like instead of, they they take jaw, you know, you the audience doesn't need to remember this, but I'm just pointing out that the, the parts are very similar. The in, They take jaw, they put jaw and lips together into one item mm-hmm. and they add an instead of that they add an item for ocular like you know blinking oh, yeah, type yeah. of movement so there's like a small difference but otherwise it's very similar so the idea of the discus was that can we make the aims a little bit more specific so under each of these categories except for ocular all the other six parts they have like certain specified things like, do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see this? I see. Yeah. And and they have their own rating. So instead of ra- having seven ratings, like in the AIMS, there's only one rating for each part of the body. And then of course the global and all those. So instead of seven parts being rated, there are 15 ratings in the discus. Oh, I see. So so it's, and similarly, they try to operationalize. Op- by operationalize, we mean like, make it a little bit more specific as to what does mild, moderate, and severe mean. But having said all this, I don't think discus is very popular. I would urge clinicians to not worry about knowing multiple scales. The AIMS has stood the test of time. If we do the things we discussed today, I think we are in good shape. Yeah. And just to be clear, the discus stands for Dyskinesia Identification System Condensed User Scale, which is a mouthful. Yeah. I agree. It's used in certain research settings, but I agree that the AIMS is sort of what everybody kind of uses and knows. And you should really get proficient at using the AIMS. Don't yeah. just casually go through and score zero, 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 zero. Any one of the, any one of the scales w- would be fine, you know. Yeah. Right. And so, and... I think now, you know, some electronic medical records are incorporating the AIMS into the electronic medical record, which is nice too. Yes. Yes. And in my case, you know, my, I'm using a more like a boutique EMR and, and it does it. So, but what I have done is it very easily lets me feed in 
uh, questionnaires that I want. So I can, I even if they don't provide it, I can feed it in. And then it's a one-time effort. And then for every patient, it becomes so much easier. Yeah, that's and, and that's a good thing for those kinds of things can trigger you to remind you to do the aims periodically, for instance. So that can be yes. useful. And that's yes. important. How, you know, one of the questions here we have is, is, how do you incorporate these screening tools into routine clinical settings? And I think this is one way that you can do that. Um, yes. You should, I think, yeah, you know, like we, every clinician needs to take a decision as to how exactly they are going to document. Are they going to do the AIMS on paper or electronically? Are they going to, like you and I were saying, that maybe aim for, for ex examining the patient formally and in detail every six months so that even if it goes beyond that, mm -hmm. we're still within the one year limit. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that you decide to do or you want to use the discus take a decision and have like a standard practice because without a standard practice, it becomes very difficult to keep track. You know, if you are seeing a lot of patients and you, you have juggling all these balls, it's so easy for things to fall through the cracks. I know certainly I, I have to be very careful about, uh, you know, having systems to remind me to do things. Otherwise, I, I don't yep. think I would. I agree. And I just want to reiterate that the modern recommendations, the standard of care now, is to screen for abnormal movements at every visit in every patient on an antipsychotic, and then to do that formal aims as we recommended a little less frequently. But we have to at least, look, I would say, just look for it and ask about it. Yeah. It's real, it takes two seconds, you know, a few seconds to do that and document so, that you did that. So the, you know, in my case, Andy, it's very, I, my method is very simple, which is that my mental status examination template you know, has general appearance, posture, more, you know, motor activity, thought, oh, you know, the usual yeah. thought process, thought content, all that. Yeah. And then it it has in, involuntary movements as one of the items. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's yeah. Very so, I like that. Yeah. That would be easy to incorporate into just your regular mental status. That's cool. Right. And that way you will not forget because it, you, as you are filling out all the items, you, you remember to at least look at the patient. There's another uh, aspect of the aims that I do want to, mention, and that is the AIMS is not a diagnostic instrument, is it? it it's uh, diagnostically agnostic. It doesn't, yes. It's just rating involuntary movements. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, yes. Of course, you know, like the person may have other involuntary movements. The one, one sort of diagnostic thing in the instructions is that tremor is, we are not supposed to rate tremor. Exactly. But if the person has, you know, dyskinetic, whether the dyskinetic movements are tardive dyskinesia or, or, or acute dyskinesia or other types of uh, yeah. movement disorders, the yep. AIMS cannot say. That requires a separate clinical judgment. Exactly, yeah. The TD is a clinical diagnosis that can be assisted of course, with the AIMS. So the AIMS is a screening tool. It doesn't give you the diagnosis and it, it helps with monitoring therapy, as you mentioned. Yes. So I think we have to be careful what it is and what it isn't. Now, you also brought up something very important that it is just looking at dyskinetic movements, not, it doesn't screen for Parkinsonism, right? Because it doesn't really yes. talk about tremors not rated on that. Okay. I'm so glad you asked this because I have received this question so many times in the past few years. Mm -hmm. So some institutions, when they create the form for the AIMS, mm -hmm. at the end of it, they insert a few questions which involve examination for Parkinsonism. So they will say, yep. you know, bend the elbow back and forth and so on. Yes. That is an add-on and that's a good idea. Sure. Absolutely. That's a good idea. You should examine, you can examine for Parkinsonism because that yes. can be very easily missed also, but it is not really part of the AIMS. The AIMS. Oh, yeah. It, it, uh, yeah. So this is very important too, when you're doing your, if you're doing an in-person exam, I of course always examine muscle tone. I look for cogwheeling, things like yes. that. Gait of course is so important. Now on a video exam, of course, you can't examine someone's muscle tone, but you can indirectly observe someone if you get them to walk back and forth and observe the gait and see the arm swing and posture and things like that. Yes. No, I, can I just add one tip in this regard is that when, the, when you are doing the activation measures, so there are these, mm -hmm. it's, if it, you are not really looking at the part that is moving. So for example, mm -hmm. if the, and your fingers are being tapped, mm -hmm. so you'll do one hand at a time mm -hmm. and each finger for about 10 seconds, mm -hmm. But you are not looking at the hands, which is so counterintuitive because yes, as the yes. patient is tapping their fingers, you, you know, you would assume we are looking at the fingers, but that's not what we are looking at. We are looking at the face, 
and other parts of the body. That's right. Because uh, the the tapping will, you know, will sometimes bring out movements that were not apparent earlier. And is in with regard to walking, what you are looking at is the upper limbs, meaning arms and hands, fingers, and in general, the truncal movements, meaning, you know, neck and hips. If you focus your attention on the neck and the hips, when we say trunk, what does that mean? Uh, so, so you focus your attention on the neck and the hip to see if these parts are moving. But w- during walking is, is when we have the greatest likelihood of detecting movements of the upper limb, the hands and fingers. I see. So when the per- person, you know, when we were doing in person, uh, when I was working at, at a university setting, I had a small office, so I would have the patient come into the hallway and, and I would have them walk in the hallway. And as they are walking, what I'm looking at is the arms, not like, you know, uh, not the, so what we are looking for in terms of Parkinsonism is different where, you know, we may be looking at decreased arm swing. Yes. And as they turn around, you know, they get disbalanced and so on and forward propulsion. But in terms of tardive dyskinesia, we're looking at dyskinetic movements of the fingers and we are looking to see if there is swaying movements of the, of the neck and then of the hips. Also, I guess we didn't talk about this, that there is another part of it, you know, so AIMS has all these different parts. So another part of it is that we, sh- we s- the AIMS are- encourages us to see the patient sideways. Mm-hmm. And the reason for seeing the person, you know, so the person is standing and you are looking at them sideways, like uh, in profile. And the reason for this is that when you look at the person sideways, you can see the hips going forward and back. I see. Better. You know, if it's a small movement, the hips are or the neck or the shoulder, like the neck and shoulder area or the hip area, the trunk movements will be better seen when when you're looking at the person standing sideways. Well, that's really helpful. Of course, we talked a little bit about differentiating tardive dyskinesia, especially from drug-induced Parkinsonism, but that's actually critical to distinguish the acute drug-induced movement disorders from tardive dyskinesia, isn't it? Yes, yes, because the treatment is completely opposite. Yeah. So yeah. if the person has Parkinsonism, meaning they have either stiffness or or tre- tremors or, or bradykinesia, mm-hmm. then the treatment is to add an anticholinergic. You know, that's like the, the treatment, first treatment might be to lower the dose or to change the antipsychotic if possible. In terms of like what you can add, it would be an anticholinergic medication like benztropine or trihexyphenidyl. Mm-hmm. But the anticholinergics make tardive dyskinesia worse. Very important. It's, it is unbelievable how often we see tard, an attempt to treat tardive dyskinesia by and adding an anticholinergic. Uh-huh. Not only does the anticholinergic not work, it makes the tardive dyskinesia worse. Yes. yes. So, so yes, as you said, Andy, like it's very difficult, very important to be cle- to distinguish between Parkinsonism and tardive dyskinesia. Although sometimes they can occur, both be present at the same time, which creates a difficult situation. That is certainly true. But you're right. I still, as I go around talking to people, there are still people who use benztropine, especially, to treat tardive dyskinesia, even if they know it's tardive dyskinesia. And I think where it may come from is the fact that before 2017, we really didn't have any effective treatments. And so people reasoned, well, if the anticholinergic works for this movement disorder over here, maybe it'll work for that one over there. And yes. Fully understanding, as you said, the pathology is completely opposite. Yes. Yes. And, this, yeah. and the same is true for akathisia. So yeah. antipsychotic induced akathisia should also not be treated with anticholinergics. They do not work. That's right. Right. And you know what it is? I, my hypothesis is that because of the term extrapyramidal side effects mm-hmm. and extrapyramidal side effects includes Parkinsonism, akathisia, tardive dyskinesia, acute dystonia. That's what we were taught in medical school and, and residency. Yeah. So, so that's why by lumping them together, right. I think it leads to the wrong conclusion that anticholinergic is the treatment for all of them. Yeah, this, for EPS in general, yeah. yeah. It's for EPS, only acute dystonia and Antipsychotic induced Parkinsonism, yes, yes and yes. but not for the other two. That's true. And, and as you mentioned, akathisia, while dystonia and Parkinsonism are disturbance of the balance of dopamine and acetylcholine, akathisia is dopamine and norepinephrine. And that's why we use norepinephrine blocking, like beta blockers and sometimes alpha blockers. Right, so right. That's that's yeah. All right. Well, 
I want to sort of sum up here a little bit. What we've been talking about is how important it is to screen for, to look for, and detect tardive dyskinesia. And in particular, we've been talking about the importance of diagnosing it as early as possible before it really gets uh, to progress and cause big problems. And we've talked about certain vulnerable populations. We've talked about using the tools to do. Raj, any other final thoughts you want to leave our audience with here? I would, I want to say something which is more emotional, which is in my discussion with clinicians, I think the topic of tardive dyskinesia makes them a little bit nervous mm -hmm. because they, because of two reasons. One is that they think that if I tell, talk to the patient about tardive dyskinesia, the patient will refuse to take the medication. Yes. And secondly, that, you know, I don't want to know about tardive dyskinesia because I'm going to be blamed and maybe I'll have a lawsuit. Yes. Neither of these two things is true. Explaining side effects to, to the patient, many studies have been done about whether telling patients about side effects leads them to refuse to take medication and, and it's not true. Plus, you know, I don't think it's an ethical thing to not tell patients about side effects. So if, if a person with, with schizophrenia, let's say, or bipolar disorder is acutely agitated on an inpatient unit and, you know, being aggressive and not, that is not, I don't mean that at that moment you're going to have a discussion, I'm going to give you an antipsychotic and it yes, can cause right. involuntary movements because, right. and that is okay because tardive dyskinesia doesn't occur within a few days. Once the person is a little better, you can have the informed consent discussion at, a, at another time. And then the other emotional part is patients will not, in general, decline to take medication if you tell them about side effects in an appropriate way. And then regarding the part about the lawsuit, remember that I'll repeat what I think I said earlier, that the medical legal risk comes not from the fact that tardive dyskinesia occurs. It comes from the fact that you didn't document that you told the patient, you didn't or you didn't monitor them as you were supposed to monitor or you failed to diagnose it when it was correctly when it was present. So, for example, thinking that it was Parkinsonism, you know, when it was actually tardive dyskinesia. So if you have consent, you have monitoring, you have correct diagnosis, then we are not at medical legal risk. That is extremely helpful. Thank you so much. And I think also the point we should leave clinicians with is that tardive dyskinesia is much more than just a cosmetic problem. It's more than just something that can look odd or funny. It, it can have significant impact on people's lives and their physical function. And I think we need to be in tune with that. And we need to not only look for the movements, but ask about these consequences and how it impacts people's lives. And one of the points I made earlier is even if it's mild, relatively milder appearing, some people, especially if they're higher functioning, may be very embarrassed and, and may hide or may, it may affect them. So I think we still need to understand that. And not, I always say not, don't make the decision for the patient by not offering treatment. You know, it's definitely something you should be discussing the treatment. And clearly now, absolute first line recommendation is the VMAT2 inhibitors. They're clearly evidence-based and FDA approved. Yes. So I hope that we've helped people to, I always say the key to TD is to recognize TD. So I hope we've raised the awareness and given them some tools to do that. And Rob, yes. I really want to thank you. I think this has been a very helpful, very clinically relevant discussion about a very important topic. So thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Certainly. And for more information, please go to our website, www.neiglobal.com, where you can find all kinds of resources, educational materials, and look for our podcasts. You can get them wherever you get your normal podcasts. And so I want to thank you very much. I'm Andy Cutler, Chief Medical Officer of NEI, signing off for now. Please stay tuned for more podcasts in the future. Thank you for your participation in this NEI CME podcast episode. To receive your certificate of CME credit, please refer to this podcast subscription page for a link to go online and print your certificate. This concludes the CME podcast presentation.